Uh, our next talk is on scaling real time at Discuss by Adam Hitchcock. Let's all give him a warm welcome. But on to the talk. Uh, so I'm an infrastructure engineer at Discuss, so that means that I need to make things work uh, at scale and uh, constantly scaling things. Uh, so I'm gonna just put this up front. I think my talk is super interesting, and if you do too, you should come talk to me because we're really looking for people that find this work interesting. Uh, we have job postings, but they're definitely not the only things we're looking for. Uh, so, if I ask the audience a question, how many of you will raise your hands? Okay, good. Good participation rate. So, um, the last time I gave this talk was at not a Python conference, so in my notes it says, how many of you actually know Python? Okay, a lot of you, good. How many of you know what Discuss actually does? Oh, wow, that is great. So this is a picture of what we do, uh, but we're a community platform, and that's manifested in this uh, embeddable JavaScript widget on your page that um, it's our front-end client, and it, powers, it, it, it allows people to uh, uh, discuss about whatever it's, uh, page it's on. So, I'm gonna focus in on that kind of orange-yellow rectangle. Those are real-time comments coming in. And the entire uh, talk is about the architecture that allows that little box to pop up. Uh, so why would you want to do real-time? Uh, it gets data to users really fast. Uh, compared to polling or any other method, you know, faster is better, because if a user has information, they might stay on that page longer. We've actually seen uh, having that little pop-up increases engagement. More people comment after real time than they were before. Uh, I think it also looks great, because it's like, slides in, it's really cool. Uh, and then we can also sell it or trade the data, right? So we can also have a Firehose product like Twitter or uh, any other company that has a Firehose. Um, uh, going to the look great, you know, this is just a visualization that we made that takes real-time commenting and puts it on a globe. Uh, you can see it at map.labs.discuss.com, works best in Chrome or other WebKit, and it's open source. Uh, it's a really cool little globe thing. So why is my talk interesting compared to other people that uh, have built real-time systems? Well, it needs to happen at scale, so we have a lot of traffic. Those are just from the last month. Uh, we just rolled over a billion unique visitors per month, like last night. And um, so anything we make has to stand up against that. Uh, so we developed a system called real -er Time, And it's called real -er Time because we had an existing bad product called real -time. Uh So this is the replacement, this is Gen 2. It's currently active on all discussed sites that uh, uh, are using our, our current product. Uh, there are a couple legacy sites that aren't using it, but they're being transitioned currently. Uh, in the testing, we did something called dark testing. I'll talk about what I meant by dark, but these are the numbers we saw during that test phase. Uh, 1.5 million concurrent users on the web cluster. We saw 45,000 incoming connections per second. We saw 165,000 outgoing messages a second at less than 0.2 seconds latency. Uh, so how did we do that? Clearly. <laughs> Discuss is almost entirely written in Python. Our core technology, most of our products is a Django app. The natural choice when doing anything is always Python first. Discuss is not built using or, or into our Django app. It's a separate Python service, but it is Python. Uh, and some other stuff. It's not 100% Python. Uh, we don't like building everything from scratch because we're a small shop. We're 18 engineers right now. 
And uh, in order to keep that, those numbers, uh, that scale that you saw earlier, we need to use other off-the-shelf technologies. So more audience participation. Who knows what Redis is? What about Redis PubSub? Oh, wow, that's the first time it wasn't everyone. All right. uh, Nginx. You guys are great. What about Thunk? Oh, like one person. Great. OK, I actually have something to teach you. So yeah, these are all off the shelf. Uh, and we, oh, and long pulling. Who knows what long pulling is? As like everyone. Huh. OK, most of you. Hey, right, cool. So quick architecture uh, overview. The, this was the old real time system. Uh, Django would, or the Discuss app, would post to memcache on a key. And then the front end client would pull that key every couple of seconds. And if there was a new thing there, uh, we would display it in the, in the client. And this was not good because it just did not scale at all. It was about 10% of our network could, could actually use the product. So we iterated uh, in June to real er time. And our first, uh, first approach to that was using Redis PubSub and Flask. Uh, Flask was also then behind HA proxy cluster uh, to make sure that something would uh, buffer those millions of connections. So this worked really great, uh, except we rapidly ran out of CPU on those Flask machines. And it's because they were doing extra work uh, redundantly. If there are two subscribers listening to the same thread, we were formatting that message twice for them. So we moved that into a backend server. So there was a Redis queue that went to that backend server. Then uh, that backend server did all that formatting work, did the pub sub back to the Flask servers. This worked great, uh, except we saw as it scaled out, it was using more and more servers, especially that Flask cluster. Uh, the Redis pub sub cluster was also growing relatively quickly. Uh, so some of these numbers are fine. We needed two servers in that back end for redundancy because you want it to still work if one of them fails. Uh, but we thought we could do better uh, on those front end server accounts. So in our iterations, we came across something called the Nginx push stream module. And this enabled us to replace the Redis pub sub, the Flask servers, and the HA proxy cluster by uh, just using this one uh, Nginx module. Uh, the reason that we were able to replace those things is that we, in that Redis pub sub cluster, we were not using all the features of Redis. We were just using pub sub. And this module had that internally. So that got us to just five servers on that front end cluster and still those two servers because redundancy. Uh, we could actually run that front end cluster on three servers, including redundancy, but we're actually running into kernel memory or network memory limitations right now. So that's just a, a socket allocation problem and it's a problem on our backlog, but we're a small team still. We just haven't uh, uh, tackled it yet. So this is the C1 million problem, or yeah, C1 million problem that uh, people are talking about on the internet. So looking into the technology behind some of those boxes and arrows, the Django, or the upper left hand corner is the Django web app. It uses post save, post delete hooks to put stuff on that queue. The Thunk queue is a, again, Thunk is a library on top of Redis that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, then the back end, it does this, uh, it, it does pipelining on that data. So it's subscribing that queue, taking that information, uh, doing a little bit of computation, and then publishing it to new, uh, other people that want it. And then Nginx push stream is that front end cluster. So, all right, one at a time now. So again, it gets, the data gets in using J Django post save and post delete hooks. They're awesome for notifications of real-time data. If you're using uh, Django already, you can just say, hey, I, on post save, or when you save a model, push it to a queue. All of a sudden you have that in your real-time system. Um, so Thunk is a queue on top of Redis. Why would you do this instead of using a real queue? Uh, well, I didn't really choose it. It chose me because I already was using Redis PubSub and I didn't have uh, uh, the time to spin up an actual uh, high availability cluster of rabbit machines. So I was like, oh, I've already got this, I can do it. 
It's really great because it's also implemented as a state machine, meaning when you put data into the system, uh, you can really see, oh, what jobs are claimed, what jobs are not claimed, uh, what do I want to do with those jobs. Uh, so when my code crashes, because that's the most likely part to crash of the system, the, it was super easy to resume or clean up after itself. Uh, something that's also great is because it's on top of Redis and it's uh, using Z sets to store that information, you could do range queries over your queue. So this is super great when I wanted to implement end-to-end -end acking. I really wanted to guarantee every single message was published. It allowed me to say, hey, what messages haven't been dealt with yet or, or other interesting things. So I really ended up liking it even though it wasn't uh, an intentional decision when I, I started. So this, uh, this system listens to that queue and we, this is where we do all of the computation. Uh, we, do, we were doing originally that formatting the flash cluster, but that wasn't a win for us because it was too much CPU. So we moved it as far back in the pipeline as possible and uh, we were even doing the gzipping at this point. So when we first moved that data, the, the formatting to the separate thing, we saw a 50% CPU reduction on our flash nodes. And then when we moved gzipping back to here, we also saw an additional 30% reduction of CPU. We ended up removing the gzipping altogether because you're gzipping individual messages in our real-time system, and there's just not enough redundancy in one of those to get a lot of compression out of it. So uh, we, we ended up dropping that altogether. Uh, originally when we were doing the uh, the Redis pub sub, we also were just publishing to just tons of keys. We said, how many keys are available in this message? So we said, oh, we've got tons of foreign keys, foreign IDs, so we have like the forum ID, the thread ID, the user ID, the post ID, and we just published to all of them because, hey, maybe someone in the future might find this interesting. And Redis pub sub and pub sub in general is basically free. You can just throw tons of messages at it, and it allows for innovation later, because it's never like, hey, can you add this feature? It's like, oh, hey, I just published everything that I could, so yeah, it's already there, go wild, innovate away. And so people have really liked that in the company. Uh, that backend server is Gevent. Gevent's the best thing ever, I love it. Uh, it really lets you write code that's easy to read, and that code uh, runs super fast uh, when you have a lot of I.O., and this is an I.O. bound system. So these are just some libraries I wrote. Uh, that uh, really helped manage those, those greenlets because we had hundreds of thousands of them. And so the top one, the watchdog, basically makes sure a greenlet is always running and the bottom one makes sure it's always running unless it's failing really fast. So uh, then raise, a, raise an exception of some port. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see the, the link, it's kind of dark gray, but uh, the slides are online and I posted the code for these things uh, there. Uh, in that back end, we did the, the way that we modeled it was composable pipelines. So the idea was that we had certain stages that the data had to go through. We had the parsing stage, we had a computation stage, and then we had the publish it to another place stage. So this is kind of a toy example of the pipeline we used, but whenever we got a message in, we called that handle function in its own greenlet, but you'll see that there's a bunch of not implemented exceptions there. Uh, what, what, what is it we do with those? So we had a bunch of mix-ins for each of those stages. So we kind of, so there's just an example, a JSON parser, uh, we use JSON a lot, um, anonymize the data by returning empty, or some super secure encryption by rot 13 in it, uh, or publish that to a file or an HTTP endpoint, right? So when we compose those, we end up getting the ability to take a message in off of Thunk and publish the, and run that through multiple pipelines because most of the time the pipelines are only different a little bit. Uh, so we were able to uh, kind of make these different examples here. So the reason this is really great is that if you are bringing up a new feature but you need to maintain an old feature, you can just make a new pipeline stage, put it in, uh, compose it in, and then you can have two of those pipelines running side by side, and you can stand up your new feature and stand down your old feature, eventually removing that unused code. The thing that's also awesome about this is the tests are also composable. So if you're testing the, each of these mix-ins individually, in order to test the full pipeline, you mix those test classes in just like you do uh, for, the, for the actual data pipeline. And now, fully tested pipeline by just writing like six lines of code instead of 
tons of tests. Um, I also like this because it's super easy to reason about each of these mixins individually. It's really easy to understand like something that parses JSON or does this one step. And it's much harder to take a new engineer in and say, hey, here's this super long thing of code that you have to understand and we're gonna change it so we're gonna like copy it all or subclass it. And that, that just gets uh, less maintainable. Um, so this was something that, that I thought up and it might be a horrible idea, I don't know. I wanna hear your thoughts on it. Uh, so this is actual discuss code that uh, powers, so the top one is the pipeline that powers the map uh, that I mentioned earlier. And the bottom one is something that powers uh, a reliable Akin uh, front end endpoint. So it's, uh, we, we have customers that have to have reliable data uh, receipt. So that one powers that. And they're mostly the same, but uh, just a little bit is, is different between them and it was super easy to write them. So what's this magic that got us down to five servers? Uh, it's called Nginx push stream. Uh, one of our DevOps guys loves to humble brag about how awesome our Nginx clusters are. So if you like Nginx and performance, follow him and you'll constantly hear how many concurrent users we're getting. Uh, we recently hit two million concurrent users uh, on this setup. And all of the code I'm about to show is available at that link right there. So again, why is it great? It handles the pub sub aspect of it and it also handles the web serving aspect of it. And it's really great at both. Uh, so it's currently turned on for 70% of our actual live network. And uh, this week we're ramping that up to 100. We've seen peaks of 950,000 subscribers per single machine. And that was an accident. We had a DNS routing error where it was all going to one. <laughs> but hey, it stayed up through it. Uh, we also saw 40 megabytes per second per machine, and that's actually lower than what we've seen. We saw about 50 megabytes per, uh, per machine. Uh, and during all this, even like at those peaks, our maximum CPU utilization has been 15% per machine. And this is all at 99.8 active writes, uh, percent active writes. So it's, we're writing to the 99.8 of these streams all of the time. And that's because we're constantly sending null bytes to them to see, hey, is the socket still open on your end? Uh, because it's better for us to transmit data and reap that socket than it is for us to just leave it open and let the machine uh, reap it on its own. Uh, so this is what the config looks like. It's super simple. You define a publish endpoint and a subscribe endpoint, and then you tell each one of those how is it that you're going to give it the information. So in that top one, the arg channel is saying, hey, use the query parameter channel whenever a published message is coming in, take the data that's posted, publish it on channel query parameter. And that second point is saying, hey, whenever anyone hits this web, uh, this location, uh, sub slash uh, regex and another regex, take those, put a colon between, and that's how we're gonna define our channels for subscribers. Uh, so that's very similar to how we do it in production. Uh, top is how you actually listen to channels and the bottom is how you would actually post to specific channels. Uh, and again, post to all the channels because it's super awesome. The only reason I could make that awesome map is because I had all of this extra data that I could look at. Um, let's see, it also has awesome measurements built in. So you can use this push stream status endpoint to get information at aggregate or individually. Uh, I'm gonna talk about why measuring is super important later. Um, so in the client, the client needs to read this data. This was the original code. Uh, this is using the on progress callback of uh, XHR request. And uh, this was uh, one of our engineers, Barack's idea. So he's gonna be talking about this stuff at HTML5 conf if the JavaScript end uh, interests you. Uh, but we're actually currently using WebSockets on most of them because WebSockets are fast. But we're moving to event source, which is super awesome. It's actually making the web browser you, uh, manage that. So instead of in JavaScript managing uh, async requests, browser handles everything and you just register what's the message type that I have and what is the, um, what's the callback I actually want to call in order to, uh, to, to see that data. All right. So when we tested it, we tested it uh, in a manner that I call dark testing. 
So Discuss is installed on millions of websites, uh, and I needed to simulate millions of concurrent connections. So what's the, uh, there's no better test harness than my existing network. If I made one and threw it up in EC2, I would in no way be able to uh, model my network as well as the network itself. So we actually put uh, code in every uh, client uh, that, that was of the old system to uh, be able to load test the, the, the cluster. And we did this with lots of knobs and switches so we could say, I only want 10% of users or exactly this website. Uh, and this was super awesome. So we were able to throw that 1.5 million uh, connections at it using our existing co uh, install base. Um, then we also had darkest time. So it's super important to understand uh, your use cases when uh, doing your load testing. We have the use case of everyone is kind of reading the news, it's a normal day, and then holy crap, something really big is happening in the news and there's a couple websites that are getting mega traffic. So darkest time was when we took all of the, the load test and we threw it to a single threat, uh, a single um, key in our, our uh, subscription system. And this really helped us find a lot of hotspots that would have definitely crashed the system. Um, measure everything because in a pipeline system, if you're just measuring input and output, uh, those numbers might be wrong. So you want to measure input and output between every stage because when the code that I wrote is saying there's 150 million concurrent users but HAProxy says there's only 1.5 million, I'm going to believe HAProxy instead of me. And so it's really important and you can really drill into where those errors are immediately. Uh, if you can also express your metrics as plus ones and minus ones, that's a huge win in distributed system as well because if you just have five systems and they're all saying, oh, I've got about 50, it's really hard to uh, combine those. Um, I also uh, write bad code and Sentry really helped me find those exceptions. It's a really great product written by one of our former employees and uh, just check it out. It's really great for like, where's the problem? Uh, so. Because I measured things, I have pretty graphs. Because, you know, graphs are cool. So this was actually when I was writing my slides <laughs> the other day. I was like, oh, I need to find some average traffic of this. So I usually go for the last 24 hours, and it was not average. Uh, so that first spike is when the white smoke came out of the Vatican. And that second spike was when they actually said, oh, it's Francis. Uh, so that peaked at 245 megabytes a second, which is like, this is in bits a second, so it's like 196 bit, uh, megabits. And we saw over six terabytes of data transferred that day. And our peak CPU was 12%. <laughs> uh, and because I'm bad at maths, this is Google saying that it was 245 megabytes. Uh, but it's actually been a busy few weeks. So we actually, so we have the Pope again is the green, then we have Hugo Chavez died. Uh, I think that I, I can't see on my, okay, so purple is his failing health, red is when he actually died, and brown is just last Sunday. So that's like a low, low news day. So, you know, we get all range of, of traffic on here. Uh, measuring everything is super important too, because you're like, sometimes what is going on? So when we got rid of HA proxy, it turns out people are still trying to connect to HAProxy and use it for our real-time system. So we still use those servers uh, and IP addresses, but for other, other systems. So this is just like, there's 100 requests a second of people that have somehow cached that IP address and are just like, no, give me the old one. Uh, yeah. Uh, could be really interesting to find out more about why. So, uh, lessons. Do your hard work early. You, like, if you're, you know, the, I, this is pipelines all the way down, data pipelines all the way down. Um, when you have your queues, put that work early, and even in the, inside your, the Python code, if you're doing the Python pipelines, do your work early. Uh, end to end acts are great because you can make promises to partners that are like, no, we want 100% uptime. You're like, eh, 100%? And uh, that, re that really helps you get there. But they're really expensive. We couldn't do it for every single front end user. Uh, so be judicious in where you use them. Um, let's see, and again, PubSub is free. Just like abuse it and 
greenlets are free. Just like use greenlets. If you're using eventlet or gevent, just like they're awesome. And they make your code so much easier to read. Uh, it's the best thing ever. Um, let's see. Hey, if this was interesting to you, I'm still hiring. So come talk to me. Uh, I would like to thank everyone at Discuss because I feel that I only had the opportunity to give this talk because they had interesting scale, uh, not because I'm necessarily the smartest person. Uh, Jeff, he reviewed literally every single line of code for this, so thank you. Our DevOps guys kept it up, they're awesome, uh, especially John who made it way more efficient by discovering that module. Uh, here are links of all the things I talked about. So look at the, oh I didn't talk about scales. Scales is how I do my metrics. It was by Greplin who is now Q, I think. And it's a kind of a clone, if you've seen Coda Hale's metrics talk, it's a Pythonic version of that. Uh, it's, it's pretty great. Um, if you don't get to talk to me now but you still want to talk to me, I'm sitting there. So come find me there. Uh, let's see, we're still hiring. Nothing's changed in the last minute. Um, and now I have questions for you because this is a work in progress. Uh, what is the best kernel config? I, like, I'm not a kernel guy. Our ops guys are too busy to answer this question, so maybe you know. I love gevent, but this PyPy thing sounds really cool. And gevent is, you know, it's, it's based on uh, the libEV. So, how, like, how do you do uh, async coroutines in PyPy? Anyone? Um, Nginx and Lua, that's like, seems awesome, right? Has anyone played with that? Uh, composing data pipelines. I've never seen that model before. Uh, is it the worst thing ever and I'm gonna, am I gonna burn, discuss the ground with it? I, I don't know. Um, I didn't get to mention a couple other things. <clears throat> Ooh, water. Uh, Kafka is a cool queuing system that we're starting to use. It's not actually a queue, it's more of like a distributed file pointer system, super scalable out of LinkedIn. Uh, what is it like really useful for compared to other queues? I would love to talk about that. And seriously, why did I not use RabbitMQ? Like, it's supposed to work great, right? So anyways, uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I, I hope um, it was as fun for you as it was for me. So thank you very much. So we have time for a couple of questions. Anyone have any? Um, is this, is, yeah, I have a question. Do you ever have memory problems on your Nginx machines? Because you're oh, pushing yeah, to tons. them and then you're spoon feeding the clients. So yeah, yeah. Um, they're not particularly specialized machines. I think they have, um, so they're, they're we, we run on raw metal. We don't use EC2, so that's our, First caveat. So I think they're eight core machines with 16 to 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, they use a lot of memory and they definitely have shared memory problems. We do rolling restarts on them over the day and this is because there's a memory leak in the push stream module. Uh, so, but it's when there's, you know, a couple hundred thousand concurrent connections per process uh, over the course of six hours, there are memory problems. However, uh, under normal, like when I'm developing, I'm running this thing in a VM with like 16 megs of RAM or something on my machine, and it's running great. So only at giant scale do we actually see the memory problems. And again, this is ephemeral pub sub that we're talking about, so restarting those machines is fine. They're gonna, if we restart a machine, it's gonna disconnect that user. They're gonna reconnect to another machine almost instantly because we're using an event source which, uh, so the browser is gonna notice super fast that it, it disconnected. We don't have to rely on this, on like JavaScript realizing it. So super fast disconnect, super fast reconnect. Uh, most of the time that means they didn't even miss a message. If they did, for us, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but yeah, and if you wanna talk more about Nginx stuff, John Watson and Mike Clark will be at our booth later and they both were the ones that actually did a lot of the tuning on those. Um, I don't know if you could talk about um, security on the, the push stream module, like is, sure. is everyone allowed to view every stream or how do you keep 
like, yeah. we authenticate as a stream. So, we, uh, so Discuss's data uh, in general is very available. Um, we're, a public, uh, we're a public commenting platform. We don't even support private forums at the, or private uh, comments at the moment. So everything going through that is already available. Uh, we do, however, use origin-based security right now. So it's not very secure. We don't do anything key-based. But uh, it's good enough because we're really just worried about web browsers abusing our system. We're not worried about people getting the data. So we don't want someone to embed this in a million other websites because that would change our load in a model we haven't predicted yet. But if you were to sit there with a curl, it would not be difficult to figure out how to get the data on your own machine. And again, it's public data. So we're okay with that. Just before the next question comes in, uh, I'll, let it carry, I'll let the questions carry on. Uh, but if anyone wants to leave for lunch, lunch is uh, in hall B. Uh, but yeah, I'll let the questions carry on. We'll so your, your comment page, you display a page, and it has some comments already on it, and then more come in. Can you talk about how, how the comments that are already there come in, and how you make sure that, that nothing's missed between the page load and then getting new stuff? Sure. The way that, the, so I actually know not a lot about this, but if you go to HTML dev, or HTML5 DevConf, the guys will be there that know a lot about it. That's uh, Barack and Ben. Uh, two of our, our JavaScript engineers. So uh, basically, they're just inserting, so they're coming in, and the, uh, either the event source or WebSocket callbacks are occurring, and they're inserting them into the DOM at the top. And the rate of these messages is not so great. Uh, only on super popular CNN threads or something is the commenting rate so high that, um, you know, it's like, 500 new comments or something. Uh, actually, the, the only times we've seen really bad performance there that people really miss comments is on live streaming events. Uh, one of our launch events was E3 2012 or something. Uh, we were partnering with IGN's live stream of Sony announcing something. So the, um, the comments there were coming in at hundreds a second, but, uh, and you could not read all of them. You definitely dropped some on the floor. But in like the pragmatic sense of our of how the you know, what the model is, they're not so fast that things are missed. Um, something that's interesting though is they don't get inserted like according to our ranking algorithm. They get inserted to the top, so you do see them up front. So uh, did that, if that did not answer, we can talk more about it later. Hello. Um, in your lessons learned section, you mentioned. Um, doing the hard work early, and um, yeah. a couple of us are confused about exactly what you meant by that, so. So, um, so hard work for us in all the way to the beginning. Okay, so going back to these slides. So in, uh, so the, I, I've not been repeating questions. What did I mean by doing the hard work early? So here in the, the Flask server, um, we were doing, we're, so we're basically getting raw messages. They're, we're taking the, the Django model, putting it on a queue, and then the Flask server is taking a Django model uh, that's been, it's basically uh, we JSONified the Dunder dict. Um, and we, so we put it over there, and it's, uh, at, at this point it's like, okay, I've got this Django model, and I'm gonna to need to do work on this. So one time, sometimes there's missing data. So we actually have to query the database to get that data. Sometimes it's, we need to anonymize data. Oh, we have to drop the IP address. And so we take, we have a JSON object in, we have to parse that JSON object, we have to do computation, we have to make sure everything's UTF-8, we have to make sure that uh, things are anonymized that need to be anonymized. We have to, it's like a 500 line file that does all these little functions of, of sanitization on these. And then we have to make it viewable by web browsers. So now it has to go back to JSON. So decoding and encoding JSON is a lot of that work. And we were, for every single model going through this system, uh, if again, if it's like a CNN thread and there's 5,000 people listening to it, we're doing that JSON decode 5,000 times, doing that uh, other stuff, rep like we're repeating it. So, the first thing we did was we did that. I was like, oh, let's do this once per server. Let's put, make a data pipeline in each Flask server. So we're only decoding that message once and publishing it to all of them internally. I really recommend 
uh, func tools and iter tools. There's a T function in there, it's great. Um, so uh, like generators are the best thing ever. So the, anyway, so um, we did it in there. But then we saw, hey, we can, the, we can even optimize this more by removing it entirely from the Flask server. So we took that work that was hard for us and we just kept on moving it backwards uh, to avoid repetition. Uh, that, that's, what I, that, that's the core of what I mean there. Because uh, this is ultimately a fan out system. You're doing work once and a lot of people are gonna see it. Thanks. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you do anything to make thunk queues um, persistent in case uh, Redis fails, or what kind of replication you use for Redis? Okay, so we use uh, fsync right now. It's not super the best. Uh, the way that we handle um, redundancy there is we have, we, we write twice from the app. So we have, uh, we have a, I think, two or three of these machines um, that we uh, do consistent hashing across. And then on each of those machines, we're running two Redis instances. So we're basically writing every message to the location and then location plus one. So uh, if a machine goes down, the message is still there. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. I don't know if it works. So. Uh, again, it's the most likely code to crash is the code I wrote because really smart people wrote Redis uh, or person and really smart people write all these other things and I, I'm smart but, you know, I have deadlines. So. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. We're done then. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. <laughs> this uh, embeddable JavaScript widget on your page that um, it's our front end client and it, powers, it, it, it allows people to uh, uh, discuss about whatever it's, uh, page it's on. So I'm gonna focus in on that kind of orange yellow rectangle. Those are real time comments coming in. And the entire uh, talk is about the architecture that allows that little b box to pop up. Uh, so why would you want to do real time? Uh, it gets data to users really fast. Uh, compared to polling or any other method, you know, faster is better because if a user has information, they might stay on that page longer. We've actually seen uh, having that little pop-up increases engagement. More people comment. Uh, our next talk is on scaling real time at Discuss by Adam Hitchcock. Let's all give him a warm welcome. But, on to the talk. Uh, so, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Discuss, so that means that I need to make things work uh, at scale and uh, constantly scaling things. Uh, so, I'm gonna just put this up front. I think my talk is super interesting, and if you do too, you should come talk to me because we're really looking for people that find this work interesting. Uh, we have job postings, but they're definitely not the only things we're looking for. Uh, so, if I ask the audience a question, how many of you will raise your hands? Okay, good. Good participation rate. So, um, the last time I gave this talk was at not a Python conference, so in my notes it says, how many of you actually know Python? Okay, a lot of you, good. How many of you know what Discuss actually does? Oh, wow, that is great. So this is a picture of what we do, uh, but we're a community platform, and that's manifested in the after real time than they were before. Uh, I think it also looks great, because it's like slides in, it's really cool. Uh, and then we can also sell it or trade the data, right? So we can also have a Firehose product like Twitter or uh, any other company that has a fire hose. Um, uh, going to the look great, you know, this is just a visualization that we made that takes real-time commenting and puts it on a globe. Uh, you can see it at map.labs.discuss.com, works best in Chrome. 
or other WebKit, and it's open source. Uh, it's a really cool little globe thing. So why is my talk interesting compared to other people that uh, have built real-time systems? Well, it needs to happen at scale. So we have a lot of traffic. Those are just from the last month. Uh, we just rolled over a billion unique visitors per month, like last night. And um, so anything we make has to stand up against that. Uh, so we developed a system called real -er Time, And it's called real -er Time because we had an existing bad product called Realtime. Uh, so this is the replacement. This is Gen 2. It's currently active on all discussed sites that uh, uh, are using our, our current product. Uh, there are a couple legacy sites that aren't using it, but they're being transitioned currently. Uh, in the testing, we did something called dark testing. I'll talk about what I meant by dark, but these are the numbers we saw during that test phase. Uh, 1.5 million